Welcome, everyone. I'm Kyle Vanderlich, the Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. A few years ago, uh, the school received an extraordinary gift to create an endowed lectureship to celebrate and showcase engineering in the two ways that engineering should be showcased and, and celebrated. One, of course, is a profession, which advances the human condition. And the second is an education, which prepares students to become leaders in a technologically driven world. This lectureship is named in recognition of such a leader, Yale graduate Victor M. Tyler. From early days working as an electrical engineer with EG&G, designing military and communication systems, the entrepreneurial Mr. Tyler went on to found Concord Computing Corporation and to pioneer the development of electronic commerce technologies that are now essential to the fiscal machinery of our society. His vision has provided financial institutions nationwide with ATM processing, debit card processing, access to a national debit network, and deposit risk management. Some members of the Tyler family and extended family are here today to join us, including Vic's sister Anne and her husband, the Honorable Guido Calabrese, United States Circuit Judge and former Dean of the Yale Law School. Sadly, Vic could not join us this year at the lecture as he's recuperating from a health issue and doing well, as I understand. And we wish him all the best as he gets back on his feet and will join us next year for the 2012 Victor Tyler Lectureship. We'd certainly miss him today, but he won't have to miss seeing the speaker because it is our lecturer today who has made possible the powerful imaging technology used in all of our portable electronics. It is with great pleasure and with a second dose of Yale pride that I introduce to you today the 2011 Victor Tyler Lecturer, Dr. Eric Fossum. Distinguished researcher and scholar, inventor, business leader, game-changing entrepreneur, Connecticut native Eric Fossum came to Yale for his graduate studies in engineering, receiving his PhD in 1984, working, with, working with professors Dick Barker and the young and energetic T.P. Ma, who is still young and energetic. After Yale, he joined the faculty at Columbia and then moved to Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he invented today's camera on a chip technology for the aficionados amongst you, and you'll all be well, versed by the end of today's lectures, this is CMOS Active Pixel Sensor Displays. In 1995, he co-founded PhotoBit Corporation to accelerate the commercialization of the technology. And in six short years, with over 100 employees and revenue exceeding 20 million per year, PhotoBit was acquired by Micron Technology. Dr. Fossum then led a venture back startup company, Simple, leading it through all the successful growth stages one can hope for in this type of endeavor, taking it from a small R&D organization to a thriving company that was ultimately, ultimately acquired by Tessera Technologies, a publicly traded microelectronics company that was looking to expand into imaging and optics. In addition to serving as a consultant for various organizations, including Samsung, he has most recently returned to academia on the faculty at Dartmouth and the Thayer School of Engineering with over 250 technical papers, 125 patents, and numerous awards. But I will point out that Yale, with its exceptional eye for talent, awarded him early in his career with the 1984 Becton Prize. His many, many other honors also include the 1996 NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal, induction into the US Space Foundation Technology Hall of Fame in 1999, and this year he was uh, inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. We are thrilled to have him back at Yale as our 2011 Victor M. Tyler lecturer. Please join me in welcoming Eric Fossum. First step is to turn it on. Can you hear me now? No. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. I didn't do anything in between, but thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, it's a, it's a great honor and a privilege to come to Yale uh, today to, uh, to talk about uh, my uh, chosen field. And uh, it's uh, really a, a pleasure to uh, be able to acknowledge and thank uh, Professor Ma, sitting over there, and uh, Dick Barker in absentia for uh, every graduate student feels this way, I'm sure, but I felt like it was five extraordinary years for me at Yale, and uh, those of you at Yale now, you will look back 
I'm sure with great fondness on your time here as well. Um, so it's, uh, it's nice to be back. I'm going to talk about uh, the science and technology of uh, digital imaging. Um, and I, I realize that uh, what better place maybe to talk about some uh, societal issues than this particular talk. Um, so this is sort of uh, maybe this part of the talk, the societal issues or questions or the baggage I've been carrying around with me for a few years. And I'm going to unload on you. Uh, <laughs> I hope I can unload it on you uh, uh, quickly and painlessly. So uh, hey, we all like to take digital pictures. Um, this one I took out up in Lake Winnipesaukee, uh, in New Hampshire, which is where I live these days. Um, why do we like to take pictures? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think uh, we like to share images with other people. We like to remember things. We like to get a sense of what I call being there um, after we take our pictures. Uh, but uh, this is not a new phenomenon. People have been uh, capturing and creating images for a long, long time. I, oops, I don't want to do that. Uh, cave drawings from the very earliest days that we can find. Uh, Michelangelo, Tormented Soul. This is kind of the way I feel sometimes. So it seems to be an appropriate uh, image. Uh, all the way up to, uh, hey, this is, uh, okay, I'm shameless. This is my cousin who uh, is painting these days and uh, doing some very interesting work. Uh, and then, uh, like all uh, good engineers uh, that are lazy, painting is like too much work. Let's find a way to uh, just capture those images automatically. And uh, photography was uh, invented actually a long time ago, but they weren't really like lasting pictures. And, and probably the best known early camera, but not the first, is a uh, daguerreotype uh, camera, um, which uh, was used to record a lot of images on uh, glass plates. In uh, the late 1800s, um, the Kodak Brownie camera was introduced. Um, where uh, actually this is the first use of a roll of film to capture an image, and you would get the, uh, the film maybe by mail, and then you would take your pictures, and you would send it off by mail and, and get the pictures back. So that was a big advancement. Uh, this is a uh, SLR camera um, from the 70s. I had one of these cameras, a K1000. It was a fine workhorse camera, 35 millimeter film. Uh, Probably everybody older than the age of 30 remembers this thing, and people less than 30 probably aren't that familiar with film. Although it's uh, strangely enough, among my daughters, a couple of which are still teenagers, taking pictures with uh, disposable film cameras is like become a trend again. I don't know why, some retro trend, <laughs> but. Uh, I was at the National Inventors Hall of Fame. I got to meet uh, Steve Sasson for the first time. And uh, we were all dressed in our tuxedos and feeling pretty good. And went over and talked to him for a while. And my daughter comes over and says, Dad, let me get a picture of the two of you standing together. I thought, oh, that's a splendid idea. And we stood there and sucked it in. And <laughs> she reaches into her purse and pulls out one of these disposable cameras <laughs> to take our picture. Or Steve and I were both like, what? <laughs> and uh, well, it turns out that was her gag gift to me for the night, was to take our picture on film. But uh, it was pretty funny. Uh, anyway, there are uh, these days there are uh, many, many kinds of uh, digital cameras, from uh, DSLRs to point-and-shoot cameras. We don't have to think, just point-and-shoot. Uh, web cameras, uh, well, motion capture cameras, uh, where you capture like an actor's uh, facial expressions to uh, to animate it. Uh, of course, cell phone cameras are by and by the the biggest use of uh, sensor technology today. Those are the most number of cameras sold. Uh, video cameras. This is a pill camera, an early pill camera. This is where you'd actually swallow this camera, and it would go down through your intestines. Actually, it was the first way to non-invasively image the small intestine. <coughs> uh, and you know, a lot better than surgery to see what's going on inside there. Uh, we built the sensor for that, uh, that device. 
These are uh, X-ray sensors for um, dental camera system, X-ray systems, where you put the actual sensor in your mouth and shoot the X-rays at it and immediately get uh, the image, which is a lot better than trying to process film. I'm sure everybody remembers, most of you remember sitting in a dentist's office with your face full of uh, cotton and something uncomfortable going on and, oh, we'll just be 10 minutes while we develop the X-rays. Yeah, this is much better. Uh, this is a backup camera from a, a car, this is a security camera, and all of these I've talked about all use the, uh, my technology now, so it's kind of fun. Uh, but then one last camera here is a 3D ranging uh, camera where I actually measure not only uh, the image, but the depth, how far away things are in the image. And uh, of course I think everyone's familiar with Moore's Law that uh, transistors get smaller and smaller. Uh, and congruent with that, the cameras that rely on microelectronics have also become uh, smaller and faster and cheaper in pretty much everywhere. Uh, this is a CCD camera, which was kind of the technology around 1993 when we invented the CMOS image sensor technology, and it's, it's a big camera. Um, by, uh, well, here, present day, here's a, uh, Here's an endoscopy camera for endoscopy. That means it goes inside you somehow. And uh, you know, which one would you rather have go inside you, A or B? <laughs> it's a pretty remarkable achievement. Uh, and cell phone cameras, even by 2007, this was a uh, cell phone camera module built uh, by my company, uh, Simpel, which had not only the image sensor and the lens in it, but it also had a MEMS-based uh, actuator to move the lens back and forth so you could do autofocus inside this module. And now, uh, just uh, another uh, four or five years, um, here's some Sony uh, camera modules that go inside your cell phone. That's what they look like if you were to take them out. Uh, 16 megapixels on them and autofocus. So uh, pretty dramatic, faster, cheaper, smaller progression over time. Which gets us to society uh, discussion, which I want to put near the beginning of my talk, so I made sure there was time for it rather than at the end when I'm rushing. Uh, but uh, you know, right now there's, uh, it's very ubiquitous to have uh, image communications uh, and there's all kinds of new ways that people interact with each other. Um, so these are just uh, kind of, uh, well of course this is my daughter, ha, and my lovely wife who's here. And this is what it's like to live in New Hampshire in the wintertime. And, uh, but this, ca this picture actually uh, is a geek picture. So this was taken, I took this in 1999, when our very first little camera that we built. And it wasn't uh, in a cell phone, it was still tethered by a cord to a laptop. And the laptops weren't that small in 1999 either, by the way. And uh, I took it on the family vacation. So everywhere I'd go, I'd like drag my laptop out, and then I'd have this pic camera, and I'm kind of holding it and balancing the laptop <laughs> on my knee and trying to take a picture and see what I was getting on the, the laptop screen. And uh, boy, I got a lot of strange looks. Uh, so, uh, and that was only uh, 12 years ago compared to what we have now. So it's pretty ubiquitous, but uh, that uh, ubiquitousness has uh, brought along a lot of issues which uh, bother me. And uh, I think as a society, we need to start thinking about what we're going to do about it. And the first thing that bothers me um, is uh, the fact that I feel like we can see too much. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, for example, during the uh, Japanese tsunami, practically watching uh, these pictures uh, live unfold, I don't know about you, but I felt like helpless. You know, I just... I. I I really felt helpless being able to see this. So you get this like godlike vision where you're kind of participating in the event and yet you're, uh, you're completely helpless. And then we also have uh, the rapid transmission of information. And you know, for better or for worse, you know, um, it's very easy for people to see what's going on in other countries. And uh, in the case of revolution, spread that revolution around. I said, for better or worse, I'm not trying to make a judgment there, but uh, that's something that wouldn't have spread so fast in the past as it uh, does today. Um, by the way, just a couple weeks ago, I uh, had the pleasure of uh, hearing uh, Bill Davidow speak at, uh, at Dartmouth. He's a Dartmouth alum, 
and he's an old uh, high tech marketing guy, and uh, I had known him for many known of him for many years. I finally got a chance to talk to him. He was actually talking about his uh, a book that he got around reading. It was called Overconnected: The Promise and Threat of the Internet. And he's mostly talking about the fact that the internet a lot gives us very fast feedback and really impacts the stock market and other things. Things get very violent. The positive feedback is very bad for the stability of systems, as I think uh, any uh, engineer knows. But it seems to me this is also uh, part of that phenomenon. There's uh, another uh, set of issues, which is uh, loss of privacy uh, from all this networking. When I first invented this uh, CMOS image sensor technology, we got a little bit of publicity, and a reporter from the BBC radio came and talked to me and interviewed me. And he said, uh, so tell me you know, how you feel about the fact that now Big Brother is going to be able to spy on us a lot better with all these cameras. And I said, oh, it's not really a problem because there's not enough people to watch all the video screens of all the cameras that are out there. We don't have to worry. But uh, to my uh, surprise and uh, chagrin a little bit, um, you know, now computers can uh, analyze images and computer systems can track you based on facial recognition software from camera to camera to camera as you might move around in a, um, a, a highly surveilled uh, city, for example. And uh, so that means that, uh, you know, you can be tracked and all your activity completely logged. It's on your permanent record now, whatever you did or something you don't want really people to know about. Um, you know, is that a good thing? I don't think so. I feel like it's an invasion of my privacy. Uh, and there's also a uh, loss of privacy from bad guys. It's uh, probably fairly imminent that you'd be able to take your cell phone camera, take a picture of a group of people. And people have done this in an experimental way already, but this will be commercial. Take a picture of a group of people and have uh, something like Google search through a uh, facial image database and quickly on your screen pop up tagging the names of all the people that you might capture at a bar scene or I shot a picture here. And, uh, and if you're, I mean, that's kind of nice that you know who people are, but if you're a bad guy, you know, you can also get all their social security information or find out if they're wealthy or not wealthy, are they worth kidnapping or not kidnapping, or they're away from home right now, so you call your friend and, hey, this guy lives at this address and he's here at the bar, he's not at home right now. Uh, so that kind of uh, bothers me. And then there's also uh, the Mad Men aspect, which is advertising. I don't know if uh, any of you uh, remember the movie Minority Report. But there was a, a scene that really struck me, which now has a real potential for coming true, that the uh, character is walking through a, a mall, and the cameras are recognizing who he is and immediately adapt the advertising on the large screens to that person and basically calling out his name and saying, hey, wouldn't you like to buy a suit today? Or wouldn't you look good in a new pair of shoes? Or, wow, I, this is like really possible really soon. So uh, I, I don't actually like that. Either. <laughs> um, I don't even like people calling me at home, so I could just I'd go crazy uh, in this environment. And then there's uh, also the well-known uh, inappropriate use, um, which uh, <laughs> this poster—it's unbelievable. Um, you know, it's uh, it's become a real society problem. There's a law in Japan right now that uh, cell phones have to make a, lar a loud, audible click. Even if they're turned to silent mode, you cannot turn that click off every time the picture is taken for exactly uh, this, this reason. And then uh, one that's also uh, important to me, um, and this is uh, talk about ethical questions between the needs of national defense and whether it's really right to develop certain kinds of weapons technology. But uh, pretty soon, uh, weapons are going to be very, very smart and very personalized. Uh, hey, I just coined this so nobody else can use this. Eye bullets. Um, kind of catchy, don't you think? Um, but, you know, uh, laser uh, guided rifles or smart bullets that are out to uh, preloaded with a particular person that you're out to try to shoot out of 10 people, you can fire into a crowd and the bullet would uh, uh, strike the, uh, hopefully, the intended person. I mean, I. I mean, I guess it's good that you're not striking an unintended target, but it's really not so good if you think about it, if you're at the other end of that, <laughs> that event. Um, people are actively working on, uh, well, this is also something practically out of minority report, isn't it? 
uh, little spider devices to go in and infiltrate places and uh, do surveillance. And you know, we could deliver lethal uh, poison to people when they're sleeping with these sort of things. Ick, not a good thing. I'm a big science fiction fan, as you can probably tell by now. And uh, here's a hunter-seeker assassination device from uh, the movie Dune back in 84. It goes out and figures out if it's the right person to attack or not. So this scares me also. I don't, don't really like this application of my technology. And uh, there's nothing I can do about it. I've now unloaded that on you, so thank you. We'll get back to the science and technology now. But uh, I hope you also worry about these things, and I especially hope you figure out what we're going to do about this in the future. Because I sometimes technology moves a lot faster than society, and I'm not sure we're ready for that. <coughs> Okay, science and technology. So back to uh, more comfortable topics, perhaps. Uh, so in a uh, camera system, we have uh, light that uh, comes in. Light comes from uh, places like stars and uh, incandescent light bulbs and fluorescent light bulbs. The light comes in, uh, gets reflected uh, off a scene, and it's uh, gathered by a lens system. And the image is then focused on the uh, digital image sensor. And uh, the digital image sensor, the photons strike the image sensor and are absorbed by a semiconductor. One thing I'll just point out on the science side of things, which is a real nuisance from uh, imaging, is that when um, a star or some other uh, black body type object gives off photons, it's unfortunately not like water dripping out of a faucet, a nice, regular, steady emission of photons. It's very noisy. It's more like freeway traffic and that kind of statistics than it is just a nice, steady drop. So as a consequence, when we try to measure the amount of light coming from something, uh, if we make a very short measurement and don't take a lot of samples, we get subject to a lot of noise because it's like trying to estimate freeway traffic by just one single picture at one instant of time in trying to estimate freeway traffic. You can't really do that. You have to integrate over a larger sample before you can feel like your, your statistics are meaningful. So we have that same problem with uh, what's called uh, photon uh, shot noise images. And of course, uh, of the entire uh, electromagnetic spectrum, our eyes are really only sensitive to a very narrow part here, what we call the visible light part of the spectrum that goes from violet through yellow and green to, uh, to red. And our eyes are the most sensitive in the green spectrum. Maybe this is because we used to live in the trees. I don't know. Or maybe that's the way God designed us. I Take your pick. Uh, photon shot noise. Uh, is uh, manifests itself not only in time but in space. If you try to ha take a nice uniform image of what you think should be a uniformly lit scene and you analyze it and you blow it up and what you find, and of course this is greatly exaggerated for the, the purposes of uh, this illustration, you find that even though the light level is should be the same, that you actually statistically measure a different number of photons in each single pixel in your image. And that gives rise to uh, a noisy, noisy image. And it has a um, quite nicely uh, behaved uh, characteristic as well. Uh, and if you're a photographer, this shows up, and this is a simulated uh, picture, but uh, you take a nice picture of a nice scene and you have a lot of noise, not only do you get this kind of speckling going on, but you can even get the color to shift on you. And, uh, you know, that's just uh, not good if you're trying to sell cameras, if your camera does this sort of thing. Another uh, thing besides photon shot noise uh, on the science side of things is uh, the diffraction limit. And the diffraction limit says that, hey, if I uh, take a, uh, a perfect point source, like a star a zillion miles away, and I put it through a perfect lens, I'm still going to wind up with this diffraction pattern of light, no matter what I do, pretty much. And the width of this airy disk, it's by uh, Mr. Airy, 
the width of this uh, disk uh, depends on the wavelength of light and also the F number of the optical system. And if I pick like F2.8 optics, common on uh, uh, cell phone camera perhaps, and I look at the green light, I see that the size of this disk, the diameter is about 4 microns, which seems pretty small. 4 microns is really small. Um, but as you'll see, we're already making pixels that are smaller than that, so that brings up an interesting question. Not only does light go through the main lens, but uh, when it goes into the uh, semiconductor, we uh, usually we have to put wires and other things on top of the chip, and so not all the light can get into the active part if it's blocked by these wires. So we actually put micro lenses on the top surface. There's some actual micro lenses that kind of funnel the light. It's not an imaging lens, but it funnels the light. Uh, instead of going down and hitting the metal wire, it funnels it into the uh, active part of the detector. And as you saw in that lesson, we also need filters because uh, we want to measure how much light is green and how much is red and how much is blue. And it's hard, very, very difficult to do that with low noise all at the same point in space. So we cheat a little bit. We, oh, I'm sorry, I have uh, remote control itis here. We, uh, we actually cover one pixel with, let's say, a green filter and one with a red filter and one with a blue filter and repeat that pattern. This is the so-called Bayer pattern, this, act, this particular pattern, uh, across the imaging array. And so at any one point, we're not actually measuring all the colors. We're just measuring one color. We'll get back to how we fix that um, soon. So once we have the light down into the pixel, we have some semiconductor device physics that come into play. And this is uh, basically what happens inside a semiconductor. And a, the best semiconductor uh, that we found so far is uh, silicon. And in uh, silicon, it's, uh, you may remember from chemistry, it's covalently bonded. I mean, it's, it's like a diamond. It really is like diamond and the way carbon bonds. Um, so uh, this is really strong. And, uh, and of course, replicates across the uh, crystal. If we put an electric field, that's this arrow here with an E on it, uh, and a photon comes in, the photon, if it has enough energy, it can actually break one of these bonds. And when it breaks the bond, it, the electron that was participating in that bond is released, and it uh, starts to uh, drift away in the silicon. There's an electron drifting away. And uh, not only does it drift away, but where it used to be leaves behind a hole. It's kind of like a bubble in water. And uh, you all know that bubbles go against gravity. In fact, if you ever look at, sit there looking at your beer sometime, and you look at the bubbles, you feel like you're looking at the bubbles. They're real things. Actually, bubbles aren't real things, right? It's, the, it's actually the beer that's moving down. It just looks like the bubble's moving up. Well, now you know I spent my time at Yale, I guess. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, that's what happens. So I would call that the hole. And both the electron and the hole participate in uh, the conduction process. Now, the uh, energy of the uh, photon, um, if it's high enough energy, then the probability that it breaks one of these bonds is really high. So if you look at blue light, which is higher energy, as you go down in distance into the semiconductor, it gets absorbed very quickly. Uh, whereas uh, a uh, lower energy photons like green or even red, they get absorbed much more slowly and they can penetrate much more deeper into the uh, silicon. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the advanced slide, so don't worry about this unless uh, the six of you that are in the audience that know about this. Uh, I'll just mention that this is the uh, structure that we, uh, we build, which is a buried PN junction or something called pin photodiode. And so we separate the electron hole pair, and the electrons are gathered in a potential well due to this band bending here in the end region, and the hole is free to wander elsewhere. And so what happens is we shine light on this device for some time, and it generates uh, lots of electrons that are gathered in this well. And at the end, we try to measure how, much, how many electrons we've gathered. It's kind of like trying to measure rain by seeing how much water you collect in a bucket out on a football field. 
uh, except that in the case of an image sensor, we've got thousands or millions of buckets across the football field. Each one is measuring the rain that's falling in there. And, uh, and when we get done with some time, you know, a thirtieth of a second, or in the case of rain, I don't know, was it an hour or something goes by, we want to see how much has been collected in each bucket, we have to somehow read out the signal in each of those buckets. So, uh, oh yeah, one other thing, by the way. Uh, we keep talking about the light coming in from the front of the chip. I just mentioned that uh, it's quite possible and uh, done these days that uh, here's the top of the chip with all the wiring, and we we're worried about using a micro lens to thread the light through these wires. But another way to do this, even though it's more expensive, is to actually thin the crystal down from the backside and put the filters on the back underside of the chip and have the light come in from the backside so it doesn't have to get past all those wires. That's called backside illumination. You'll see cameras out there now that advertise using backside illumination, like Sony's Xmor R series of, uh, of chips. So uh, now we have to read out all those buckets of rain or uh, buckets of signal. And uh, the way we, uh, sorry, the way we do that uh, in the old days is with a CCD, which is a shift register. We actually just move the charge electrostatically from place to place to place to place and finally all the way out to the corner of the chip where it goes out through an amplifier. And this idea of moving charge through a semiconductor in this way uh, was actually uh, the subject of the 2009 uh, Nobel Prize, which was given to Willard Boyle and, uh, and also Smith. Uh, unfortunately, Boyle just passed away uh, recently, but uh, not so long ago uh, that the Nobel Prize was awarded. Now, uh, okay, so shifting the charge out is, uh, is not so good. In fact, uh, let me make the comment that uh, while you're trying to shift the charge out here, if you have any defect in the silicon, it will block the transfer of charge through it, just like someone was blocking it. Not, uh, not a good thing. And in fact, if this kind of uh, device goes up in space and there's some energetic particle that comes in and breaks the silicon or make, creates a defect in the silicon, it will also uh, wreck the image sensor. And my job when I went to uh, JPL was uh, the chief scientist at that time at JPL asked me to uh, help them with this problem of reliability of CCDs in a space environment. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we fix that problem? And that's where I started working on this active pixel uh, idea and uh, in the active pixel, of course, we have the, the charge. It's generated in each, uh, each pixel. And uh, we're also going to in also integrate an amplifier inside the pixel, uh, each pixel. And the only reason I could do that is because of Moore's law that we could actually make things that small at that time. So timing is pretty important. And uh, by uh, uh, basically this little circuit here, the voltage that goes into this amplifier um, decreases over time as more and more uh, light is absorbed in the semiconductor. And at the end of this time, which may be a 30th of a second for video, uh, we read out that voltage and that tells us what the light intensity was at that particular spot. So uh, that's organized by uh, having all these pixels and the amplifiers and a bunch of switches and then some, uh, some analog signal processing and, uh, and as it turns out, because we don't have to transfer this charge a lot of steps, uh, we can use just mainstream microelectronics technology, CMOS technology, to make this chip. And if we use mainstream microelectronics technology, that means that not only can we build this device, but we can add all kinds of other electronics to the same chip, because they all get made at the same time. That's the magic of microelectronics and why it's uh, so cheap these days to buy uh, computers. So in our case, not only do we integrate this, this readout, but we can put the A to D converter, we can put timing control logic and uh, all kinds of other uh, things on the chip uh, for um, basically making a camera on a chip. So we have all this other stuff on there. And now we have a chip where you can just like basically put in power and out comes an image. So uh, that, uh, that paved the way for building really miniature miniature cameras and gave rise to all those problems, which I didn't foresee back then, sad to say. Um, 
the uh, integration these days on cameras on a chip is quite uh, extensive. Uh, we'll talk about color interpolation a little bit, but there's all kinds of things that have to happen uh, on chip, like flicker detection. You know, these lights up here are actually f flickering on and off at high frequency. And if you try to take a picture and it's not synchronized the way the lights are flickering, uh, you know, part of the image might be exposed and part of it not exposed so well, depending upon the shutter. It gets complicated, but it looks ugly, believe me. So you have to figure out exactly how the lights are uh, flickering so that you can avoid uh, that effect, just as one example. Color interpolation, I told you that uh, we kind of cheat. We only put uh, red, green, or blue filter over each pixel. Uh, but uh, it only takes you a minute to think about how we might fix that later. And that is, let's, let's say we've got this pixel right here. We, we know what the red is exactly, but we don't know what the uh, green or the blue is. And so what do you do? Well, you just say, okay, I can just average the, the four greens around me, and I'll call that the green value at this point, and I'll interpolate from the four blues and call that the blue at that point, and I'm done. Now I have a red, green, and blue value. The only problem uh, that with that particular algorithm, as simple as it sounds, is that uh, the, uh, the red sample is from a point, and the green sample is averaged over this neighborhood and the blue samples averaged over that neighborhood and that's kind of asymmetric and we really don't like <coughs> some artifacts that that, that yields in our, uh, our final image. So the actual algorithms people use for color interpolation are much more sophisticated than that. But that gives you some idea. Hey, not only does the camera have to do all this stuff but um, there's more to the story because uh, when you take a picture and then you look at it on the screen, you expect that what you see looks as good as what it looked like when you took the picture, if not a little better. Special thin you out feature or something, who knows. Enhance the color, give you a little better skin tone or something like that. So, uh, and there's also, uh, just to, oh my goodness, I can't get the hang of this. Uh, there's also, uh, the step of having the display has got its own characteristics. Not only do we take uh, the pictures through silicon that's got color filter ray characteristics and silicon absorption characteristics, then we go through display, it's got its own uh, spectrum of light that it puts out in different ratios and, uh, and the green, the, the display is covered with uh, red, green and blue filters and it may not be exactly the same filters that are in your camera and you want to try to make those match. And it's, uh, it's quite a job. Um, so uh, the light out part is, uh, is also a big step. So that brings us to the state of the art. Uh, the state of the art uh, for uh, sensors for consumers are in the 8 to 16 megapixel range now. Pixel counts for professional cameras are maybe up to 20 to 40 megapixels. Uh, 100 megapixels for aerospace. And pixel sizes are maybe down to 2.2 to 1.1 microns for common consumer applications. Well, if uh, you've been following the thread here, I mentioned to you that the diffraction limit says that, uh, hey, you know, the best we can focus a spot to, and that's only the center spot, is four microns. And yet we've got pixels that are 1.1 microns. What does that mean? Well, it, it means my favorite saying, almost my favorite saying, which is, the force of marketing is greater than the force of engineering. <laughs> if the number on the box is bigger, it will sell. So, hey, nobody ever really checks the resolution anyway. We'll put more pixels on, and uh, maybe someday someone will figure out in software how to make the images better. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's physics that's working against you, so uh, it's not so easy to fix. But uh, Hey, uh, it pays the bills so uh, for us engineers and gives us uh, something to do. The, uh, and uh, before long, uh, you know, it took a long time to go from uh, television resolution, which is 0.3 megapixels, to HDTV resolution, which is about 2 megapixels. But the next generation is uh, super high vision or uh, uh, UDTV, uh, which is 33 megapixels at least 60 frames per second, maybe 120 frames per second. This is a really high uh, data rate, and for a long time, most of us thought 
that will not happen in our lifetime because it took so long just to get the in television broadcasting infrastructure to go from TV to HDTV that going to 33 will never happen. But now that video is delivered by network in packet form and a bunch of other things that we really never anticipated, it doesn't have to get broadcast across the air anymore, uh, maybe the adoption rate for uh, UDTV or super high vision imaging will be a lot faster than we anticipated earlier. So maybe I'll get to see that. Uh, I, I actually saw uh, a UDTV camera. Actually, we built the first chip for the first UDTV camera. Uh, at uh, in Japan a number of years ago, and uh, they had a uh, they also had to develop a display technology, and they had this big movie screen. And you think that going to the movies regularly, you think you know what the resolution is, but when you see something that's at this resolution, it really is lifelike. You don't realize how much you're missing in a normal projected image until you see a UDTV image projected and it's like wow look at those trees at the back of the field I can see the branches on those trees just like you can in real life so that sensation of being there of realism is really much more pronounced when you go to the super high resolution than on normal TV so should be interesting ahead to have a wall size display in your house to watch video on that's at that really realistic resolution it should be pretty interesting especially if it's in 3D so coming attractions, well, uh, first coming attraction is more camera phones. Uh, so uh, this is a trend from Sony. Uh, everybody has their own numbers, but uh, this is what Sony thinks the market has been and will look like. So pick us out here in uh, 2011. They're saying it's about 1.25 billion cell phone cameras, camera phones will be manufactured and sold in 2011. So that works out, I forget uh, what that is, but it's probably like on the order of one per second that's manufactured, which is pretty astounding if you think about it, a camera a second. It's also equally astounding if you think about that's one cell phone per second going into landfill three years from now or two years from now. Kind of scary. In just a few years, that number is going to climb up even more. So it's a remarkable growth. And then this also shows that the resolution is going to go from maybe 8 megapixels in those camera phones to probably a lot of them will have 12, megaphones, 12 megapixels in just, uh, just a few years. A trend in pixels uh, also, as you can guess, is getting smaller and smaller. And FSI means normal front side illumination, and VSI is the back side illumination we were talking about. And this is pixel size going from 4 microns. Hey, by the way, this is the the diffraction limit for green light on f2.8 down to one micron or 0.9 microns coming up so uh, these really small pixels are, are coming in in product to you soon so why do we want smaller pixels well smaller pixels allow uh, smaller chips reduces the chip cost to the camera module maker if you can make a smaller chip it costs less because uh, they buy wafers, not individual chips. If you can make more chips per wafer, you're in good shape. Uh, a smaller uh, chip means that the optic size is also reduced, and that cost comes down. And uh, smaller camera modules, then, are more desirable for integration into consumer products. You know, now you see a lot of cameras that are embedded into your display screen at the top at the little bezel, or you want it in your very thin iPad, you want a camera built in there, you know, it's got to be really small. If it's really small, you can put it practically anywhere. Um, so that's, uh, that's good from a consumer point of view. Unfortunately, the negative side of things is that the uh, non-recurring engineering cost of the chip is higher, so that tends to slow things down. Uh, and the performance of the pixels is usually degraded because when they're smaller, they collect less light, basically. Um, I won't go through all these reasons. Or you can either reduce the size of the chip or you can put more pixels per chip is, uh, is a flip side of that. So uh, that's good, and, and more megapixel sells more cellular service traffic because you have higher data rates or larger data files. You need bigger computers, better software, mass storage requirements go way up. So hey, everybody's on board this train, okay? This is a good thing. So push, push, push for more pixels. Hey, we can't see the image any better because of the diffraction limit, but 
the bigger number on the box helps lead to all these other benefits as well. And that's just the name of the game. Okay. Uh, so on to uh, subdiffraction limit pixels. This is just a, uh, a graphic on a 0.9 micron pixel pitch, and there's that 4 micron uh, diffraction limit. We see that, hey, there's a lot of pixels inside that blur spot. Uh, so there really is some real limit on how small it's practical, according to the way we make uh, sensors now. Another thing that's coming uh, in the future is higher dynamic range. So we can take pictures that have, uh, you know, you take a picture inside a room and you have a bright scene outside the window and you'd like to get both things show up in the image at the same time. You know that's practically impossible right now. That's just because of the range of light that a single image can capture. We want to improve that. Um, higher speed readout is not only good for slow motion, but it's good for blur reduction. And I see this already in uh, a recent camera that uh, I bought. That under low light, I go to take a picture, and it actually takes like four pictures or six pictures. And the reason is, of course, my hand is shaking as I'm taking, trying to hold steady on this low light, long shutter time image. And so it divides it up into like four separate exposures that are shorter. And the idea is that the amount of shaking that goes on during each short exposure time is small. And then I take those four separate pictures and I use software to register them back together again and get rid of the blur. And I can only do that if I have a very high speed readout. It's pretty clever. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay. Now there's also research activity. Um, that is, uh, may change the paradigm, and I'm going to talk more about the quantum image sensor because that's my own uh, favorite thing, and the 3D imaging I'll also talk about in a moment. We're almost near the end of this talk. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, mention that computational imaging uh, may be important. This is where uh, we do certain functions like this, getting rid of blur by adding images together, or even more clever things by using uh, the increase in computation that's also come along in the course of Moore's Law. So now we can compute a lot of things that we couldn't before. So you could maybe take an image that's out of focus and mathematically restore it to perfect focus, for example. Uh, another uh, example of that is a planoptic sensor, which may or may not pan out uh, commercially. But that's a sensor where we actually have a lot of little lenses on the chip with a number of pixels under each lens. And every each lens is aligned a little bit differently to the pixels underneath and sees a different part of the image, kind of like spider eye maybe, or fly eye kind of thing. And then we use computation to put all those images back together and make one nice image. We'll see if that goes anywhere. Okay, so uh, let me, so this is my research. So now uh, notice I put the societal issues first, and I know that I'm going to get jammed on the time for my own research, but that's okay. If you, uh, if you want to go really small, uh, I want to consider a, uh, a very specialized tiny pixel, which I term a jot that comes from the Greek for a smallest thing that's sensitive to a single photoelectron. And the jot, state, the jot state changes from zero to one, kind of in a binary way, when a photoelectron is present. In order to sense that, we need some special single electron amplifier or single electron transistor, um, which is uh, small and compact. And we're going to want billions on a single chip. So the jot itself has to be really small, maybe uh, 0.1 to 0.5 micron pitch. So that's 10 times 10 smaller area than what we're seeing in the state of the art. So 100 times smaller area than the state of the art. And billions on a single chip is also hundreds of times more jots or pixels on a chip than the current state of the art. And if we do that, we could build a gigajot sensor, and it would only be uh, about a quarter inch in diagonal. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, the astronomers now are putting together a gigapixel telescope camera. And that chip, actually, you can't put a billion pixels on a single chip right now. So they actually have like hundreds of chips, all carefully mounted and calibrated on this giant platform to get up to a billion pixels. So uh, maybe in the future we could put a billion pixels just uh, in your cell phone camera. Uh, and also a, uh, an interesting thing about this is a change in the paradigm because right now we have this bucket that's out on the football field that's collecting rain. And uh, here's the, uh, here are the raindrops that come in and hit the bucket and in the end we read out the value uh, 
of that uh, signal, and we decide that that corresponds to the uh, gray. It's not black, it's not white, it's somewhere in between, it's gray. But if we actually count every single photon that hits the, the image plane, um, and not only that, we read it out very quickly at very high speed so that uh, we only get kind of sparse, uh, sparse illumination on every single subframe. We can take a lot of subframes over some area and do some sort of nonlinear 3D convolution both in space and time and to generate some uh, image pixel value. So rather than being confined by the physical boundaries of the silicon <coughs> pixel, now we're really uh, not confined. Our pixel is now kind of a, uh, a software kind of construct. So we've really uh, moved the whole idea of image formation um, so that it's, it's very digital and we're kind of preserving the digital nature of those photons that come in in light. Uh, so here's uh, what it looks like. The most important thing on here besides the fact that there's billions and billions of these jots and we have to read them out at high speed it means the data that comes out of this chip, uh, if you calculate it out for normal illumination, is somewhere around 10 terabits per second. So, uh, you know, we can figure out how to do maybe uh, 10 gigabits, maybe 100 gigabits per second read off off chip. That's state of the art. So somewhere in the next couple of years, we're going to figure out how to do this. I don't know how we're doing it, but I know we're going to do it. So we had a discussion earlier about do you have faith in what your technology is? And I'm 100% sure that we will solve this problem. I just don't know how it's going to happen quite yet. The second and uh, last uh, thing I want to talk about is just uh, uh, sensing not only the normal image, but sensing the distance to objects. And I think you all have an intuitive idea about how sonar works. This is not so different. Uh, in this case, uh, well, if we just sent out a single pulse of light from this LED and it bounced off an object and came back into the camera, it's easy to just write down the speed of light and distance and, and calculate what the, uh, the elapsed time is. Or if we measure the elapsed time, we can work backwards and get the distance to the object. Unfortunately, that doesn't give very good signal to noise ratio. So uh, we're going to set out a series of pulses of light that bounce back and go to a particular pixel and, a, and light that also bounces off uh, some other place in the scene and hits a different pixel. And notice that because the distance to the object is different, in these two things, and also because I'm good at cartoons, the, uh, there's a phase difference between these two pulses that come back. And so if we draw the LED pulse and the, the return pulse, we can see that uh, the phase difference is due because of the difference in uh, distance to the object. So if we can measure the phase difference of these pulses, we can also get range. And so we just have to do that for uh, all the pixels in the sensor to get the uh, result. This is not a new idea. This has been around for quite a while. Um, it's one of the projects I'm working on though with Samsung. We're trying to catch up to a lot of people. And I, the only reason I'm talking about it now is because we've caught up and actually gone past other people now. So it's, it's worth talking about. Um, so uh, this is a device that, uh, okay, I invented, but it's a, a special kind of uh, device, sensor device. It's a lock-in pixel. And uh, we built an array of, uh, okay, not too many, but uh, we can actually, this is a, collect a decent range image. This is a, a picture of somebody standing there with their hands up. And it's uh, color-coded according to distance so that this brighter light green means it's closer to the camera, and this means, this color means it's farther away from the camera. It actually goes from one meter to seven meters on this color scale back here. And if you look at the extracted distance versus the real distance, you see we got a very nice linear result, and the distance error is well under 1% over that distance range. Now, uh, that's an odd pose, you might think, for somebody to take a picture of. Whoa, stop. But uh, not really. Uh, the reason is, is that this type of uh, range sensor is very good for gesture control. So Connect is already out in the market. You know, it, you kind of do things with your hands or, and it controls the game. Well, I take that a lot more steps further and the first thing you have to be able to really do to do good gesture control is be able to see individual fingers. 
And that is the point of this particular pose, is that we can actually discriminate all the, the fingers on the hand. And then as the fingers move, we can see that difference in distance. And again, like some science fiction movie, we can uh, control computer screens or movies or no, don't need the remote control to your TV anymore. Or all kinds of applications, good and bad, I'm sure, that we ha I haven't thought of yet, but uh, uh, it's probably coming soon. One step beyond that, where we are now, so this is state of the art research. In fact, this doesn't even get announced until February, so you're getting a preview. Uh, we're interested in this vision, where you can take a picture with your cell phone camera of something. And, uh, okay, so I do work part time for Samsung as my consulting activity. And so what does Samsung build right now? They build 3D TVs. Well, that's just lovely. That's like building HDTV before their HDTV broadcasts were out. It's like there just isn't a whole lot of 3D media content out there. We have to enable people to be able to make 3D content before we can sell a lot of 3D TVs, right? So it's a big push to, uh, ever since the movie Avatar came out, frankly, to, uh, to be able to generate, uh, to, to allow consumers to generate uh, 3D images. And so in this case, we've taken a two megapixel color sensor and uh, every now and then we've inserted a time of flight range sensor inside. And of course the color sensor we know works, works fine and uh, this image uh, shows the color coded range sensor for much higher resolution now. You can actually see what's, you know, here's a lab, there's a whiteboard and computer terminal and some other stuff in the background and it's all coded as far as distance um, in uh, <coughs> distance from the camera. And you also see the speckle, and hopefully, now that we're at the conclusion of this talk, you have some inkling of where all that speckle noise is coming from in this image. It means that we don't have very good signal-to-noise ratio, and we're seeing a lot of shot noise. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to conclude with uh, a couple of uh, comments. Uh, first, uh, okay, I've listened to a lot of rock and roll in my uh, life, so life's been good to me so far. Some of you know that song, I'm sure. Uh, Image sensors have come a long way since the first generation device is CCD. A second generation device, CMOS Active Pixel Sensor, is going strong, billions and billions served. I'm very, I'm very susceptible to advertising, I guess. Uh, much interesting work, I believe, lies ahead as we move the digital divide as close as possible to the digital nature of photons. And in a uh, ode to uh, Bill Davidel, I think this overconnection of billions of massive information gathering engines. I mean, think about how much information a camera gathers, and there's billions made per year out there, is going to lead to some very interesting societal issues and questions. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Yes, so uh, which advanced? The, any of them? Uh, well, I, I think that what I call my dark anxiety closet, I open the door. So all those things just get worse, I think. And uh, you know, it's, it's really hard as an engineer not to go forward and you know, it's, oh, guns don't kill people, people kill people. I don't know about that argument, but uh, it's a good rationalization sometimes. And uh, I don't know uh, what the story is on this technology. I, uh, I hope it's used to the good. I know it's not going to be always used to the best. And I, yes, I have lots of anxieties. And I think I shared them with you already. Yeah, so uh, the question is, can I say something about uh, moving? And I guess you mean me versus technology, or? Yes, no, you mean academic life. So me personally, academic life versus? Yes. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's not that different. <laughs> um, I think that uh, 
A big part of academic life is nurturing people and their skills and moving them along and ahead. And if you're a good manager in a research lab or any corporation, that is one of the things you focus on is helping move people forward and up um, in the process of accomplishing your goals. Um, as, a, uh, as a professor, you uh, develop a lot of communication skills. Well, maybe I didn't exhibit them all, but there, you need strong uh, communication skills. And you need to be able to communicate your ideas or vision to uh, sponsors for research. You need to be able to communicate those ideas to students. Um, and in uh, industry, it's the same thing. If you are trying to raise money, you're still trying to communicate your vision to people with money and get them to part with their money and give it to you to accomplish. So you have to, you have to give them the spirit, right? You need to really uh, evangelize, uh, evangelize your uh, uh, your vision. And uh, I and well, I'd say that part is the same. And that's probably the hardest part of any job is, uh, and it's always it's been the same for me from being a university professor and trying to get money to being in a government lab, which guess what, you still have to get money from other parts of the government, to uh, being in the private industry where you have to go get money. <laughs> it's really, it feels like the same job to me. Um, so it's, uh, it's not that big of a transition. But I have to say of all these things, really developing people and relationships with people and watching them grow beyond what I've taught them has been really, uh, the most rewarding part of my career so far. When, at what stage in your life did you realize that you could come up with something new, something original, rather than just you know, work something out? And what was your reaction to that realization? OK, so the question is, what stage of my career did I start coming up with things? And what was my reaction to doing that? And I have to say that. Uh, I had the good fortune of participating in um, a science program at, in Connecticut at the Talcott Mountain Science Center up in uh, Avon, Connecticut, which was a kind of a supplementary uh, high school uh, program on Saturdays. And uh, there were a lot of uh, very uh, bright people that were in that program from the state, basically, around the state. And I always felt like a slacker because they were always coming up with these great ideas about what to look at and everything. I was like, I can't come up with any good ideas. And I was really discouraged. And uh, college, you know, I was like, OK, I, I could solve problems. I could do things. And, uh, and, you know, I started having my own ideas. And what I thought when I had the idea was, well, certainly someone's already thought of this. And there's something. I'm not seeing as to why this idea hasn't already like made it to big time yet, and I'm just too dumb to figure out what that problem is, and can't possibly be true that I came up with something new. And, uh, and there's so there's a self confidence issue that kind of comes up when you come up with something new to really believe that it's new, and uh, and it's hard to overcome, and it's over the years. And now I feel like wow, I get ideas all the time now, and. Uh, I still feel, I just had an idea the other day for, uh, I said, that, well, I won't go into the details of what it was, but I talked to one of my colleagues who's in another field. I said, surely this exists already. He was like, no, I don't think so. I'm like, really? I'm, maybe it doesn't. On the other hand, I started a company uh, a year and a half ago based on an idea, which I thought was a great idea. And I searched the web. I didn't see anything. And uh, dragged in a partner, and we worked on a prototype thing. And uh, just before we were about to file a bunch of patents, which meant spending a lot of money, I did one last Google search. And I must have typed in a couple different keywords. And right there in front of me was some master thesis from Carnegie Mellon from like 12 years ago. It was exactly, exactly what I wanted to work on, out there in the public domain. And uh, the whole IP core that we're going to build this company on just went poof. And uh, guess what? Sometimes those ideas are already been had, even if you can't find them at first. Thank you. So Eric, those, those jots that you showed are very reminiscent of spike processes that happen in neurons in the brain. And have you ever thought that you could use some, some of the neurophysiology research, or does your research might impact on, on that field? Uh, well, I actually, I. In it, 
earlier versions of this talk, I talked about maybe applying uh, neural networks to processing this data. Um, but I think the fundamental difference is, and, uh, and maybe it's not a, a blocking factor, but silicon technology is a planar technology. And biological neuro neurons and are, is, is a 3D topology. And I think that makes a big difference because you can only get the data out in a planar form. You get lots of wires coming out, but it's kind of still kind of planar in a topological sense. And so I think the interconnectivity is is limited. And I don't know uh, if you could just read it out fast enough, and then have a fast enough processor that re-emulates that 3D connectivity or not. I think it's an interesting open question, but we're not quite ready yet to uh, attack it. But yeah, very good observation. Thought about that several times. One last question, maybe? Let me just uh, uh, comment in by way of conclusion that on this day when we celebrate engineering through, through your talk, it could not be a more fitting celebration in the sense that engineering really is the bridge between the sciences and the humanities. We apply scientific principles to advance the human condition, of course, and you cannot do that without considering all the consequences and implications of the technologies that are being developed. And that's what Yale Engineering is all about, and you are the ideal epitome and representation of what we do here at Yale. So thank Shucks. you so much for your talk. Now, stay put for one second. I'm going to give you a gift, a small token of our appreciation. You're not going to give everybody a car? Well, I not everybody a car, but we'd like to offer you a chance to take a picture on your cell phone <laughs> of the man who invented the picture on the cell phone. So I'll, I'll give him the gift up front, but in front, but please feel free to stand up and take a picture. <laughs> so, a small token of our appreciation. Wow, that's a big token. Ice buckets, but oh, uh, it's for the, for that uh, beer bubble for experiment. For the next beer bubble experiment, right. come on out. Seriously, for those who do want to take a picture of the man who invented the yeah. camera. <laughs> Thank you. Love it. Thank you. I invite everybody to a reception right outside, uh, where you can uh, talk to, uh, uh, with Eric, ask him any questions you'd like, and uh, please join us there. So thank you again. Thank Great. you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.